Laura Perryman in Seattle, Washington. And I'm delighted to be here with all of you on this awesome platform, especially joined by our incredible ocular surface disease fellow, Dr. Sathi Maidi. And she uh, <laughs> uh, helps us with clinical research and she's a fabulous writer, presenter, artist, and human being. So it's awesome to be doing this with you today. Yes, I'm excited to be here. Great. So we've got a big topic on our hands today. It was funny when we were preparing for this talk, it was, there was definitely some uh, un, uncharacteristic procrastination because we're like, this is a giant topic. Like, how are we going to compress it into 45 minutes? I feel like I'm squeezing into Spanx or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's take it away. Let's get into it. Yeah, so here are financial disclosures, and our topic is going to be cosmetics and ocular surface inflammation. All right, so I think you have control of the slides, so let's talk yes. a little bit about ocular surface inflammation. My favorite topic, I'm a molecular immunobiologist prior to medical school, worked on Enbrel, and so this inflammation story is so interesting to me. And lo and behold, inflammation is in the definition of dry disease by the TFOS 2 committee. You've seen this definition many, many times. If you don't know it by now, come back later because you really <laughs> just need to have this under your, under your, your, your core understanding of what's going on. Loss of homeostasis, hyperosmolarity, inflammation, neurosensory compromise. Those are all very relevant concepts and it helps us to understand the bigger picture of what's actually going on. But what, is, what does inflammation have to do with any of this? Go Tina, go Tina, next slide. <laughs> Love her. Okay, so quick primer on immunopathophysiology. And I think there's a couple build outs on this slide. So there's innate immunity and then adaptive immunity. And just kind of click more, a couple more times. The innate immunity is just like the gut response, just like trigger happy, boom, I'm reacting to whatever's happening. Um, there's a conversion into adaptive immunity. And we think this has a lot to do with the development of chronic dry eye disease. Uh, it also helps us to explain why allergic conjunctivitis has an immunologic bridge with MGD. With some really interesting work out of uh, Duke and uh, Danny Sabin and Nancy Reyes lab. Next slide. So this is from a paper that we published in 2020 I, I tried to explain um, what's really happening on as visually as I possibly could because there's a lot of really interesting stuff and it's very complicated, but it doesn't mean it has to be hard to understand. So this is just a, a picture of what a healthy response to inflammation, injury, infection is and what happens with dry eyes. So in short, you have this innate immunity activation, amplification, recruitment, and then in a healthy eye, you have resolution, restoration of immunoregulation, and return to homeostasis. But with dry eye, you lose that final part, and it becomes this chronic vicious circle cycle that we uh, talk about. I'm a huge fan of the work of Christophe Baldwin. Um, his BGO paper 2016 is mind blowing. Next slide. So, when we're talking about corneal immunopathophysiology, there's a lot of words there, but the concept is the same. You have some type of inciting event, amplification of the response to that event, recruitment of the effector cells, and then damage and chronic self-perpetuation. That's all this really says. And it turns out that the dry disease immunopathic physiology is very relevant when we're talking about cosmetics ingredients and ocular surface inflammation. So stay tuned, we'll get there. Just laying the groundwork here. Next slide. And this is a little video there. Hopefully it'll play. They wouldn't let me use music, so I'm going to sing to you and I apologize in advance. So imagine that song, You Dropped a Bomb on Me, Baby, <laughs> where you see arrows dropping is where the medications work on this four part cycle that we talked about with chronic dry disease. Initiation, amplification, recruitment, damage and self-perpetuation, uh, corticosteroids, or excuse me, um, yeah, corticosteroids, lifidograst, cyclosporin, uh, even our uh, omega fatty acids where those work and also intense pulse light and where it works. So hit it one more time. So as you watch these arrows come down, you'll see that there's many 
attacks at this four, four cycle engine here that is the chronic self-perpetuation. Just as a visual, wow, all of these things are impactful across lots of different aspects of this immunopathophysiology story. Next slide. Okay, what about the impact on the nerves? What about neurosensory compromise? Next slide. Okay, so here's where things get really interesting. We have to start talking about something called TRP receptors, transient receptor potential. This is a super family of sensing, uh, sensory receptors that is so well conserved across human li or life on this planet that even nematodes have little receptors in their nose so that they can know if they're coming up against something. Oh, noxious. I don't want to go that way. So it's, it's hardwired into us. And it's the intersection of where the nerves can respond and the immune system. It's almost like a common language. It's almost like Google Translate. You're in, in distress. I'm in distress. What are we going to do about it together? And this becomes a system that can be aberrantly activated through exogenous agents such as cosmetics, and it can be amplified in other disease systems such as um, dry eye disease, migraine headache disorder, all of these things start playing into it. And even rosacea is a neuroinflammatory response that is centered on the TRP V1A1 story. And you might be thinking to yourself, whoa, there's a lot going on there. How am I gonna remember that? Well, if you go to the next slide, here's how I remember it. <laughs> Vanilla ice, baby. Yep, TRPA1 and V1. <laughs> or, or Anakin Skywalker, if you're of a younger generation. Like, so it's, there's lots of ways <laughs> to just get an idea of what, what this means. Like, these are characters, right? Um, and this is the stuff that we're going to be talking about as we move forward, particularly because of the pipeline that is that we have coming down the pipe on, um, on therapeutics. So specific to the human corneal nerves, this is on the the neurosensory part of that tfos 2 definition. Um, this is just a few of the TRP superfamily, and they have uh, mixed activity. So you can like do an agonist on one and an antagonist on the other and get differential effects. But I want to point out a couple things. In the TRP V1, antagonists are, also, are studied in other disease states and other organ systems, and they may decrease pain, inflammation, neovascularization, and scarring which is very, very interesting with ocular surface disease, right? Inflammation is very much a part of that. Now the TRP M8, M is uh, uh, menthol activated. And this may this is uh, activated by cold. We know that uh, ocular surface disease patients have a lowered firing threshold for changes of temperature through small fibers uh, that elicit pain. It's a protective mechanism that the gain gets turned way up on it. So those nerves are like all the time. It takes nothing for them to go ow. So they're hypersensitized. And TRP, I mean, is one way that it gets there. But if you agonize or stimulate TRP, I mean, you can get a soothing effect, i.e. menthol, right? Next slide. Okay. So when we're, just as a simplified diagram of how these things intersect, vanilla ice and the human eye, we've got the uh, receptors on the eyelid, that cooling uh, effect on the eyelid, on the cornea, we have TRP A, uh, V1 through 4 and M8s, and also on the conjunctiva. And I think there might be a couple build-outs here, but I want to point out, because this is relevant to the pipeline, there's... Um, ARI has a TRP M8 agonist and their phase two data was very exciting. They're about to start phase three. There is a eyelid wipe out of Asia. I think it's made in Korea. I don't remember the trade name because it's written in characters that I can't read and understand, but <laughs> the molecule is called Cryosim 3 and it has a wonderful soothing, cooling, tear stimulating, pain relieving effect via that upper upper uh, diagram in the upper right, showing how that uh, TRP M8 agonism actually is negative inhibition against pain messaging signals from the ocular surface, from the dry eye patient. So very cool. So this uh, uh, paper just came out and it talks about uh, relieving neuropathic pain for patients. Next slide. 
So then we get into just breaking it out just a little bit further. We've got the, these are pain receptors, right? On the, on the left, uh, mechanoreceptors to, for mechanical touch, polymodal receptors are pain and heat and cold, uh, warm temperatures, cold temperatures, all these things. And these channels are implicated in those, in those nociceptive firing responses to stimuli. And that's designed to protect the ocular surface. But in disease states, it becomes dysfunctional or dis dysphonic, like a like a, a kid trying to play a violin at age five versus when they're 25. There's a big difference, right? So that's just dysphonic. Um, the, and again, where the pipeline is on these medications, you're going to see under pain, heat, TRPA1, V1, cinnamaldehyde. That's very relevant when we're talking about cosmetics and dry eye inflammation. We will get to that. Next slide. Okay. So the TRPV1, it's, it's multimodal. It's uh, designed to detect heat. It's a protective mechanism. Humans are the only ones that purposely eat hot, spicy peppers and put themselves in pain. I mean, there might be some kind of strange like um, an endorphin response or something, but let's put this in perspective. You've got the humble bell pepper and then the hottest pepper that we think of is the Cal Carolina Reaper, right? At 2.2 million Scoville units. Well, the hottest thing on earth eclipses that tenfold and it is 16 billion Scoville units. And that's something called resiniferotoxin. It comes from this humble little plant found in Africa and uh, ingestion is toxic and patients and uh, animals will die of necrosis of the gut. So don't, don't eat this. <laughs> Next slide. And this, this technology of the uh, TRPV1 antagonist is the basis for a phase two uh, study by Novartis looking at a molecule to help patients with persistent pain after PRK, LASIK, or uh, cataract surgery. So if you have patients that are still in pain four months after a uh, surgical event, uh, please send them over for uh, evaluation for this really important study for bringing innovations about for that tough uh, disease state. What about TRPA1 agonists, right? So we've got, here's our friend cinnamaldehyde. This is, and the derivatives of that family is commonly found in cosmetics. Toluene is also an agonist and it's the main solvent used in those, um, those beauty sponges. Those ones, that, those, those funny egg looking things. And all the guys in the crowd are going, what are you talking about? <laughs> These little egg looking things for applying your makeup, a uh, little sponge. And there's a ton of this molecule in there. This is the molecule that makes a super ball smell bad. Um, another uh, generational reference that may or may not ring true. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> okay. Um, cinematic, uh, and then I'm going to turn over to Dr. Mady here in just a sec. So the cinematic acid derivatives are prevalent in cosmetics. Some of them are used for UV protection, but they also activate TRPA1 and can be associated with a pain response, inflammation, um, especially in the context of type 2 inflammation, TH type 2. Uh, be really careful in your patients with any kind of atopic dermatitis, eczema, psoriasis, um, atopic keratoconjunctivitis. They really should avoid cinnamaldehydes because of this synergistic inflammatory response. Um, in the context of uh, TH2 cytokines. And because of this uh, TRPA1 V1 activity, it might help to explain why it's such a high allergenicity uh, potential agent in the dermatologic literature. Next slide. Let's see. And then lastly, the neuroinflammatory mechanisms of rosacea. This story is interesting. I gave a lecture on cosmetics. This was like five or six years ago at a, a aesthetics conference. And I was talking about dry eye and TRPV1 and A1. And the dermatologist after me was talking about rosacea and he got up and he talked about TRPV1 and A1. We look at each other like, that's happening in your disease state too? It's like, yeah. And we had the best time nerding out. So the story gets even more interesting because CGRP is a common uh, neuroinflammatory messenger um, that's implicated in dry eye migraine headache disorder, rosacea, sleep disturbances, et cetera. And so they, we have five CR, uh, CGRP antagonists medically available that are they're, uh, FDA approved for patients like this. So it um, just helps to explain a little bit that, that neuroinflammatory clinical picture that we commonly run into with ocular surface disease. And it also helps to explain 
why so many of these rosacea patients have such sensitive skin, like they could barely put anything on their skin without creating some kind of reaction. It's just a very inflamed situation. Next slide. Clinical trial pipeline. Dr. Mighty, would you like to take, take it away? Yeah. yeah, so, you know, I think Dr. Perman already talked a little bit about this, but, you know, why learning about the super family is so interesting is, you know, not just how the cosmetics relate to activating these certain pathways, but also for potential treatment options for our patients with, you know, various ocular surface conditions in that, you know, we're finding new areas that we can target. Um, we already talked a little bit about um, the TRPV1 antagonist by Novartis that is currently um, enrolling Pay, uh, trial subjects. Um, it's a 12-week parallel group study. Um, main endpoints are looking at our improvement in post-refractive surgery pain severity scores. Um, another TRPV1 antagonist, also I believe currently in the phase two trial, is by Silentis. This one is slightly different. It's an miRNA molecule um, that this particular study is focusing on subjects with Sjogren's syndrome um, and to see how this may improve corneal staining as well as improvement in dry eye symptom scores. And then also the other TRPM8 agonist by ARI, um, this one I think finished up the phase two a, 2B yep. phase last year and then it's currently in phase three right now. Um, but the results for that were very interesting. Um, they found improvement in symptom scores, anesthetized Shermer scores, and found that of the concentrations that they studied um, at the 0.003 concentration seemed the most effective. So it'll be really interesting going forward um, to see you know, if we'll have some potential new treatments down the road. So kind of switching to cosmetics ingredients, you know, this is a really common focus of a lot of these types of talks about cosmetics is like, what ingredients do I need to tell my patients to avoid, essentially? And um, with this talk, we kind of wanted to go into thinking about it a little bit more differently in terms of helping you as doctors think more critically about these ingredients think why are they included on these lists, should they really be, um, and understand more of the nuance and complexity when it comes to understanding these. Um, first, we'll talk a little bit about preservatives. I think, you know, preservatives come up a lot on these lists. We're all familiar with BAK, you know, as an ingredient we want to avoid, and a lot of the traditional preservatives like formaldehyde donors and parabens and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, yes, we want to make sure that ingredients aren't contributing to ocular surface disease, but the thing is preservatives are really important, you know, preventing microbial growth of bacteria and fungus, you know, parasites is, is really important. Um, and so you can't just not include preservatives in your formulations for ingredients, um, but we need to look a little bit at you know, how they're testing the efficacy of these preservatives. Um, so one of the most common ways that they test preservatives is something called the PT, or the preservative efficiency test. Um, and essentially, you know, what they do is they'll, they'll take the product with the preservative, they'll inoculate it with, you know, certain types of microbes, and then just let it sit. And then at certain time points, kind of assess if there's been microbial growth. And I think they typically go up to about 28 days. And then if there is growth, you know, they'll change the formulation. If there's no growth or only a minimal amount of growth, you know, they may consider it safe. Um, and there's a couple of things to sort of think about with this. So one is, you know, is just inoculating something once and then waiting and sitting really a good proxy for how people use cosmetics in real life? Not really. You're dipping back in every day you're using that product. And you're um, using it for more than 30 days, right? Right. And, and yeah. yeah, you know, most people use them way longer than that. Um, and then, you know, also what we do know is there is typically some low level of microbial growth that, that is allowed in products, but there isn't, you know, from the research I did, there didn't really seem like a standard that was required. So different companies are going to sort of allow different amounts of this. Um, and so, you know, one, is that even an effective way to do it? 
And then just looking at preservatives in general, you know, it's more complicated than it just being good or bad. Um, a lot of this information, I'm going to credit to Dr. Peter Pham. He's done a lot of work on this. Um, and one thing is, you know, for preservatives to really work well, they kind of have to be toxic. <laughs> like they need to be able to kill <laughs> stuff or they're just not that effective. Um, and so, you know, that's why when you're like using a heavy cleaning agent, you have to wear gloves. So it's always a balance between, okay, we need something that's going to be effective. That's actually going to kill the germs. That's also tolerable, you know, to, to human cells. Um, and so, you know, one thing that he talks a lot about is this concept of Brandolini's law, which is like this internet idea, um, also known as the BS asymmetry principle, which is basically that the amount of information needed to refute an original small BS claim is like a magnitude larger than the information that was needed to get that initial idea out there. Mm -hmm. And so this concept shows up a lot with cosmetics in that we'll have one little study, one little kernel of information, and people will just extrapolate that into saying this ingredient is toxic, you need to just avoid it completely. But if you really look closely at the study design, it's like, okay, yeah, maybe it says something like this concentration of this preservative on a human cell culture killed those cells. But is that really equivalent to what a smaller concentration is going to do when it's actually applied topically? You know, not necessarily. So there's a lot of things like concentration of the product that's going to matter, how it's actually going to interact in vivo versus in vitro. The biochemistry of these compounds is really important. The study design is really important. And also the combination of preservatives. It's not just one ingredient sitting alone in these products, you know, they all work together. And so you need to consider that as well. And of course, you know, the reason why we care about preservatives is microbial contamination. It, it's there, you know, basically all the studies they've done on, on makeup have shown that there's microbes growing in there. So, you know, one study that PAC et al. did in mascara, they actually distributed new mascara to 40 subjects, um, two commonly used brands, and have them use them for three months, just a normal, you know, one-time daily application. And at the end of the three months, they found in 36% of the tubes um, were contaminated, most commonly with staph and strep, as well as some fungi. And this was just a single person using the same mascara for three months. Um, other studies have also found growth in used products. So Bashir collected donations of various used products um, that sort of varied in how long they had been used. And they found that up to 90% of them were contaminated um, with up to 102 coliforming units um, per milliliter, which is a lot. <laughs> um, so basically everything that people had used had some microbes growing in it. And we also know that people use products way beyond how long they should be. <laughs> Um, one, I think the problem is people don't really know how long they're supposed to be using products, um, or even if they do, they feel guilty because they're so expensive and they don't want to waste them, so they keep using them. Um, but another study in 44 students um, found that on just a self-reported questionnaire that almost 98% reported using expired products, and mascara was the most common one, um, and they collected samples from subjects that showed that particularly in mascara samples, 79% had Staph aureus and 13% had P. aeruginosa. Um, so, you know, there's really high contamination rates that our patients are putting on their eyelashes every day. Um, and it kind of goes along with that to, to be really careful with sharing products because, you know, at this point we know we're contaminating these products. And it's one thing if you're the only one using it, but particularly if you're sharing with someone else, you're going to get their bugs and their demodex. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But so you want to be really careful about trying samples in stores careful with makeup artists that are using the same products on multiple people, you know, make sure they're changing their applicators and not like re-dipping and dipping. Um, a study by Dashi, uh, sorry, Dadashi, 
collected samples um, from shared beauty kits from 10 beauty salons and found, you know, 95% of the samples had fungus or had bacteria, and then 19% had fungus and yeast. Um, and that the most contaminated products that they found with fungus um, were powders and eyeliners. So, you know, we need to have those preservatives in these ingredients to prevent all this microbial growth. Um, and then here are just some general guidelines we had come across about, you know, when to toss products. And I definitely think this is one of those things that's better to be more conservative on than not. <laughs> like if you're not sure, toss it out and start new. When in doubt, toss it out. Exactly. I actually got a bacterial conjunctivitis from a big box beauty store once. They, yeah. they, the technician went to put a little sample or whatever. And I ended up with a pink eye the next day. It was gross. I mean, I mean <laughs> you can see it's like it was probably contaminated. So yeah, yeah, there's a real risk for, you know, bacterial infection, bacterial ulcers, eyelid infections. Um, so we want to be really careful about this. So we'll kind of go back a little bit to um, the ingredients and preservatives in the cosmetics and why we need to think more critically about them. You know, I think our, our understanding of cosmetics and how they impact the ocular surface, we're sort of in this stage where the pendulum is swung. We, we started from this point where no one really knew much about it. Patients kind of assume that these products are safe. Doctors weren't necessarily putting together the pieces that it could be impacting their ocular surface. And then now we've kind of swung the other direction where consumers really are interested in this. They want safe products. Um, and the kind of problem is what has happened is we've started to vilify a lot of ingredients and just say, okay, this one study said you shouldn't use this. And so we're just saying, okay, don't use this product anymore um, without really looking deeper into it. So um, alcohol is one of those. You know, if you look at lists of ingredients to avoid, just the word alcohol shows up a lot. Um, and so you might think, okay, well, when I'm looking at my ingredients, I'll just avoid alcohol. But the problem with that is, you know, as we know, we all took OCHEM when we were students. Alcohol is a huge category, you know. All it means is that a structure has an OH group on it, you know, just the O's on it. Um, and that can include everything from, you know, an aldehyde to carboxylic acid to fatty alcohols and all of these chemicals vary greatly in their biochemistry, in their structures, in their properties. So to just say an alcohol is bad because we deemed, you know, that certain ones were drying. I think this is the biggest concern for people is that alcohols are drying or they may be allowing easier penetration of other ingredients. And yes, something like rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol is quite stripping and irritating, um, but that's actually rarely found in cosmetics versus other ingredients like sorbitol or glycerin, you know, which are included as humectants and stuff like that have actually been shown, you know, glycerin-3 um, has been shown to have osmoprotective properties. So we can't just vilify alcohols in general. We need to really look at the structures more closely. Um, you know, and the other thing we want to think about is concentration. So looking where in the list of ingredients are they included? Basically, the higher up on the list, the higher the concentration typically. And so certain ingredients like ethyl alcohol or denatured alcohol here have been shown to be drying, um, you know, even more drying than isopropyl alcohol. So if you're seeing that high up on the list, you may want to avoid it. Um, but just because something has a, you know, an all in the name doesn't mean you necessarily need to automatically avoid it. Right. And, and it's, I, just, I, rarely, I read a lot of labels and that's, it, I was uh, very surprised to actually see that on that product. I rarely see um, denatured alcohol on an ingredient list, but it does happen. Right. So I'll um, throw it back to Dr. Perryman for formaldehyde donors. Cool. So formaldehyde, think back to junior high dissecting the frog, right? That smell from the pickled frog in the formaldehyde, that's a, uh, what we're talking about here. So at high concentrations, it's an awesome preservative. That, that frog is going to last longer than you and I in that 
jar of formaldehyde. Um, but also think back to gross anatomy lab in undergrad or in med school. Um, formaldehyde is what preserves. So we use it at low concentrations as a very effective preservative. But this is one of those ingredients where there's some uh, uh, cell culture data demonstrating a harmful effect on, on cells. So specifically, you have to learn how to read these chemical names. You just have to. Hydroxymethylglycinate is a formaldehyde donating preservative. Whenever you see that in an ingredient list, you know that formaldehyde is going to be liberated as soon as it comes in contact with water or a tear film or just moisture on your skin. So that's something to watch out for. Uh, DMDM hydantoin, I call it the dum dum molecule, is also a formaldehyde uh, preservative. Quaternium 15, polyquad, uh, those are formaldehyde donors, and then finally ureas. Um, so let's go on to the next slide and show you something. So this is a cell culture study where they took uh, BAK, a known you know, cytotoxic preservative, and formaldehyde at different concentrations. And what they did is they tried to uh, see at what concentration the cells survived or not. And then they tried to support survival by adding growth factors. Come on, baby, you can make it, you can make it. So that's the experimental setup. And as you can see that uh, with the BAK, um, there is cell uh, dropout and also with the formaldehyde donating preservatives. So it, it doesn't take much to impact human corneal and meibomian gland uh, cell cultures with these agents. And this is uh, several peer reviewed papers on this. Um, when you're talking about you know, the cornea, that, that becomes uh, interesting because it is such a easy access um, for a lipid soluble uh, agent to reach those corneal epithelial cells. When you're talking about meibomian glands, it, it's a little harder to, to make that um, extrapolation. Uh, but basically, the growth factors couldn't stop the cells from dying in response to formaldehyde. And again, those, those agents are hydroxymethylglycinate, DMDM hydantoin, ureas, and quaternium-15. Next slide. Uh, phenoxyethanol is another uh, molecule that uh, gets um, uh, uh, vilified, and I think unjustifiably. Uh, and just a little quick organic chemistry for you. Phenoxy, the phenol is an O, is a benzene ring with an OH on it, and then the ethanol group is tacked on. So phenoxy, ethanol, right? It's kind of cute. Um, that's how it gets its name based off of its structure, and you'll, you'll learn to recognize these structures and their names. So at low concentrations, phenoxy ethanol, particularly in conjunction with ethyl hexylglycerin, doesn't cause cell death. When you combine those two preservative agents, phenoxy ethanol plus ethyl hexoglycerin, you get a synergistic um, preservative antimicrobial effect at concentrations that don't impact cell survivability in culture. Let's look at the data. So here is a cell survivability assay with prolonged contact times at differing concentrations. And what you can see is, uh, look at the uh, group C there. This is phenoxyethanol. And at 0.1 to 0.01%, there's not a statistical difference between the survivability of the cells with control. Um, the parabens, again, at low concentrations, uh, don't impact cell survivability. And so when you see products that have, you know, three or four different types of parabens, methylparaben, ethylparaben, you know, and the list goes on and on, um, they're probably using much lower amounts of all of those things. And... Um, that cell culture study actually has to be done separately, right? But as a single agent at lower concentrations, it looks like uh, my bone and gland stem cell cultures survive fine at certain concentrations. And it turns out that over-the-counter and uh, uh, pharma, what's what I'm looking for? Uh, cosmeceutical grade skincare products, the methylparaben concentrations, and phenoxyethanol concentrations um, are low and similar to the concentrations where there was good survivability. And so, you know, this is just in cell culture. And to your point earlier, I really appreciated what you said about in vitro data and extrapability to in vivo data. And I think that's, that's a very different thing, particularly when we're talking about in cell culture with prolonged contact times versus 
topically applied uh, temporary there and wash off formulas. Next slide. Prostaglandin analogs. Oh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. <laughs> we all know about prostaglandin analogs because of, uh, we use it all the time for glaucoma management, right? Zalatan was a game changer back in the day. When it first became available, that was the first one we had. Now we've got several. Um, and the class of prostaglandin analogs is actually um, an organic chemist's like dreamland with all these different names. And it's like molecular Legos. You have the basic backbone of it and you can tack an ester group here. You can put some chlorine on the, on the carboxyl end. You can like, or on, on the terminal end, you can do all these different things to it structurally to change its potency, to change its side effect profile. The ones that we have as glaucoma agents are cherry picked for their tolerability, but we're all aware of the prostaglandin analog mischief, orbital fat atrophy, dermatitis, hyperpigmentation. Yeah, your eyelashes grow, but at what cost? We get meibomian gland dysfunction. Um, Mokan, Mokan et al. Uh, described that uh, glaucoma patients using prostaglandin analogs, 92% of them had MGD versus only uh, 50 some percent, 58 percent on other classes of glaucoma medications. So the association with prostaglandin logs and ocular surface disease is well established. Um, but you need to learn to read the names, right? So I don't expect you to rattle this off your tongue. Methylamidopropyl or <laughs> methylamidodihydronorophoprostol. <laughs> Here's what you need to know. Prost. I want you to look for that root prost in the prostaglandin. It's like a Polish drinking chair. Prost, right? So that's what you're looking for when you read your, your ingredients labels. Well, here's where cosmetics comes into this. These are called adulterated over-the-counter eyelash growth serums because they pick, you know, they're not picking bimatoprost. They're not picking travaprost. They're picking other prostaglandin analogs and putting them in there in the formulas to get the lash growth effect but you also get all the side effects. That's the problem. This one in particular is popular in Europe. And I'm seeing so many but patients by telemedicine in Europe, young women with significant fat atrophy, my bone gland dysfunction, permanent uh, pigment changes. It's, it's a problem. Um, and they, how they get around this is by marketing it as the appearance of longer lashes, I'm not saying gives you longer lashes, that's an FDA drug approved label and we have but one option and that is Latisse, which is bimatoprost and not nearly as potent as some of these bad boys. Next slide. Isopropyl chloprostinate um, is, a, uh, is the most commonly used one. It's the uh, one that's uh, in the formula Lash Boost and that clash action lawsuit settled and the results of that I think will become public in early March. Um, because they were late, they still laced the formula with isopropyl chloprostinate, which, um, and not, and did not disclose the risks of those agents to the people using them. So looking at this from a molecular Legos perspective, this is really fun. The isopropyl chloprostinate has a structure that makes it approximately as potent as Travaprost, our most potent topical glaucoma prostaglandin analog. Um, weren't forthcoming with what the concentration is. That's trade secret, right? And so the consumer's left to guess. They are pouring a pro-inflammatory, MGD-inducing, orbital fat atrophy, complications riddled product onto their eyelashes. And we'll get to this in a minute, but the duration of uh, clinical testing prior to launch is anywhere from 28 to 56 days. And some of our patients are using this for months. So that longer term safety profile is simply not there. And so it's no wonder that we're running into these problems. A tea tree oil. This is another interesting topic. So tea tree oil also gets vilified unnecessarily in my humble opinion. And this is what we found in our information hunt uh, of trying to think critically about this and really understand what, what the real story is on this. So tea tree oil has very important antimicrobial properties at low concentrations, which is great for getting the bacterial load down in say like eyelid hygiene products, right? Um, at higher levels, you actually get a Demodex killing effect, which is good because Dr. Maidi and I um, study Demodex a lot. 
And they're kind of like cockroaches, the eyelids. They're really hard to kill. <laughs> so <laughs> it turns out 5% tea tree oil is uh, tough to tolerate uh, for humans. So you have to get up to that level to get to that point. Um, and then at that point, you've got some issues with uh, cell survival as well. So, but what we're talking about, typical over-the-counter concentrations of it, the final concentration of T4O or terpene 4 all, which is the active component of tea tree oil, um, in, uh, in topical formulas, it's below that concentration where they saw cell death. So it's a really important thing to know. Your commercial products, your commercial eyelid uh, preparations, you know, clean and then rinse off, they're going to be at safe levels if you're looking at simply cell culture survivability. Um, and then just one other cool thing. So tea tree oil is like the whole a lipid isolate from the plant and the terpene for all is an isolate of it. And typically it comprises about 50, five, zero percent ish of the total concentration. So parabens is another one of those big ones that I think is potentially even unjustly vilified. You know, this shows up a lot on lists of ingredients to avoid, not just for facial cosmetics, but in shampoo and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, and I think a lot of us, you know, when you think of why cancer is what comes to mind, we think parabens are carcinogenic. Um, they, uh, you know, have estrogenicity to them. They're associated with breast cancer and stuff like that. We need to just avoid them. Um, but if you look more closely at that, you realize a lot of these initial claims came from this one first study by Darbra in 2004, which in an end of only 20 women found parabens in breast cancer tumor tissue. You know, one, okay, it's a pretty small sample size. And two, correlation doesn't equal causation. Like just because they're found parabens in this tissue doesn't mean that it was contributing to the to the formulation of the tumor. Um, and so, you know, we do know that some parabens do have some estrogenicity um, to them. But it's much, much, much lower than things like estrogen, estradiol. Um, and typically, it, it's only an issue in really, really high doses, way higher than anything that would be in a cosmetic product that you actually use. And this is another area where the biochemistry is really important. You know, there are a lot of different parabens and the estrogenicity of them increases with the chain length and branching of the compounds. So some of these smaller chain compounds have really been deemed to be pretty safe. You know, yeah, we may want to avoid some of these longer chain compounds, but that doesn't mean that all parabens are a problem. And, you know, part of the issue with this is parabens are actually really effective preservative mm -hmm. and generally well tolerated on skin. You know, it tends to not have a lot of um, allergic effects and things like that. So in this, you know, vilification of parabens, it's forced chemists to try to use other types of less effective preservatives in cosmetics when it, you know, kind of unnecessarily. <laughs> it's like they didn't need to do that. Now you're getting all this growth when we had something that was pretty effective. You know, parabens are just um, P-hydroxybenzoic acid esters. They're found in berries. We eat them, um, you know, and, and a lot of people will say, okay, a lot of these studies show that a lot of parabens show up in urine samples and people and stuff like that. But again, like, what information is that really giving us? You know, does that just mean that it's a sign that they have rapid excretion and that's not really a problem? So it, these are all things we just need to think a little bit more about. And kind of like with a lot of the other things that we've talked about, we found that in low concentration in these cell culture studies, they're really pretty close to control. There really isn't cell death at low concentrations. Um, and there's a lot of fear mongering about this on certain sites that are commonly used like EWG and Think Dirty that a lot of people use to determine whether a product is safe or not, um, that, you, that we just need to be more careful of and be more critical of some of these sources of information that don't include things like concentration or structure. You know, I would be really, wary of things that aren't including that information when it's telling you that something isn't safe to use. Um, a source that we do like, which we'll talk a little bit more about, is a great Instagram account run by a cosmetic scientist 
um, who actually does show a lot of her references and stuff like that. So she may be a better resource for that. Back to you. PFAS. PFAS. What, well, what's that? Well, it's uh, ubiquitous in the environment. It, they do not break down. And this uh, sensationalized report uh, found that PFAS was in several high percentage of cosmetics products. Well, it, because it's found so ubiquitously in the environment, the contaminant isn't what's added, it was in the water that's used. And it doesn't really break down. We don't understand, or we don't have enough knowledge of it on the impact on biological systems, but it wasn't like they were spiking it with, with PFAS. So just it's, PFASs are very useful. They're used for your nonstick coating on your pans. They're not all bad. It's, again, it comes down to chemistry that's much more sophisticated than some of these um, headlining articles would lead you to believe. So maintain your healthy skepticism and think a little deeper and think chemically. Next slide. Retinols. I'm still trying to really get this story in my head. Like I've always found a paradox between, oh, never use retinols. We all know Accutane creates havoc on the ocular surface. But what we also know that vitamin A ointment, uh, like what's in Hylonite, Hylonite and Vitapos are, have vitamin A in it and it promotes ocular surface healing. So which one is it? Well, it turns out it's nuanced like everything else that we're trying to explain and, and share with you. Um, vitamin A has normal metabolism and the highly purified, concentrated uh, uh, trans uh, um, uh, isotretinoin is what Accutane is. So there's, uh, but in normal, just topical biochemistry, it turns out that cis retinol has actually, there's receptors throughout the ocular surface, and it's critical for ocular surface healing. This awesome paper um, by... Uh, uh, Dr. Flugfelder was one of the investigators of that paper. It's naturally occurring. It, it promotes ocular surface healing, which is one of the reasons why vitamin A deficient patients that have had gastric bypass surgery have ocular surface breakdown, is they can't heal because there's no vitamin A uh, to, uh, to interact with the retinal acid receptors and promote healing. Next slide. Bacuchiol is often... Um, often presented as an alternative to retinols, but I haven't seen any information on its uh, appropriateness for use around the eye. So I actually don't know. Our Jirlene is super interesting. It's touted as Botox in a jar. And I, I was scrolling through Instagram one night. And I, I saw this. There's these little studded things on these eye patches. And you put them here and it kind of creates like this little like dent in your skin <laughs> and delivers the our Jirlene. I I was just like floored that this was actually a thing. Um, so you're, uh, with that, you decrease orbicular strength and tone, which probably is why you get that like rel wrinkle relaxing effect. Um, but you also get decreased uh, force of pump in that terminal blink with getting a teeny bit of myelin out of the terminal ductules. So I think this is a very bad idea. I went to the website, there's nothing on ophthalmologist tested, dermatologist tested, nothing. Next slide. Right. So carbon black is another one that will show up a lot on these lists of ingredients to avoid, um, but often without a really good reason, generally just as it's a carcinogen and it needs to be avoided. Um, but again, if you look deeper at the studies, almost all of them are about inhalation from the combustion procedure that is used to make the carbon black that they think could contribute to things like lung cancer. Um, and then if you look even deeper, you realize actually most of these studies have been done on rats and not on humans. And so a lot of this, again, is can we extrapolate this data, data from these studies to how topical application of these products is going to impact human cells um, you know, in regular use. And I think now a lot of the information is shifting towards as uh, so the, you know, scientific committee for consumer safety here actually deemed that carbon black in its nanostructured form, you know, at a larger size really is safe, particularly if applied on intact skin. You know, I actually came across a paper that showed that they had deemed it to be safe to be used in surgical sutures. You know, as long as it isn't the inhaled form that we're concerned about, um, it really does seem safe. So again, another product we don't necessarily need to just 
automatically demonize, but really look closer at the studies that people are using to come up with these claims. So in summary, ocular surface disease is complicated. The inflammatory and neurosensory compromised part is relevant when we're talking about cosmetics ingredients and its cosmetics role in inducing dry inflammation. We have a new family of molecules to learn about, the TRP superfamily, super cool and interesting. Uh, not all ingredients are bad. It's not that simple. You can't just say you're the bad guy when, you know, even Ted Kaczynski has a short, a, a, a kind side, I think. I don't know. I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm getting to the second point. So I think you, you just, we're inviting you to look deeper, think longer, think harder. It's nuanced. It's complicated, but it's also a lot of fun to learn about. And let's keep learning together. Um, we would love to hear from you. If you have any questions or interesting papers, please send them our way. And thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Laura and Sati, for such a uh, really important lecture. And thank you for being a part of this awesome program. And um, I mean, it's just look at all the dialogue. I mean, this is just a, a lot of interest in this topic. We really should know how to answer a lot of these questions and really dig deep into this. So really, it's, it's not an easy one to take on. So I really appreciate you doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, we were and I, and I want to just uh, encourage everyone to uh, see these two amazing lecturers uh, later this afternoon. They are going to answer the question, if you have a dime in your pocket, should you still do dry eye or not? And so that's going to be a really cool one to, to see too. Um, on, on some of these questions, um, you know, Laura, one of the things we were talking about is this concept of eye safe and how that relates to this, this lecture. Can you please kind of talk us through uh, your thoughts on that? Right. So with cosmetics, there's a lot of uh, latitude and smoke and mirrors around regulatory claims. And it's a problem for us as eye doctors, because when we hear eye safe, in our minds, we're thinking that phase three randomized placebo controlled study looking for a safety signal, looking for side effects, like actively looking for ocular problems. That's not what happens in cosmetics. So when you hear eye safe, or a safe for sensitive eyes or safe for contact lens wearers, keep your skeptic hat on because the regulatory uh, bar for making that claim is embarrassingly low. Yeah, awesome. Um, you know, one of the things that I think that there was some, some definitely quite a bit of interest in is um, um, Demodex. And I just wanted you guys to kind of maybe share your thoughts on, you know, we kind of cover it uh, a little bit, but really having your expertise in how you specifically approach the patient that you have them look down and there's a lot of deep left. How do you approach that? Dr. Maidi, do you want to take that or do you want me to? Um, yeah, I can. You know, I think a lot of us are starting to realize the role and importance of Demodex um, and it was probably something many of us were kind of ignoring. And I think part of also why we ignored it is we just don't really have great treatment options for it. You know, lid scrubs and lid hygiene are probably the primary one that we do. And we know that can sort of keep the cholerets under control, but it's not really killing the Demodex, right? It's like you have to keep up the lid hygiene all the time. Um, so we have been looking into other potential treatment options. Um, Dr. Perryman has done a lot of work with IPL as a potential treatment. And the other thing um, I think we're all very excited about is the new Tarsus drug in clinical trial, the Lutlanier. I think if once that comes to market, it'll be a game changer in terms of our options for treating Demodex. I agree. And I think for our patients who have MGD and Demodex, like hygiene is important. It's so important you want to brush off the dead organisms that are like literally, they don't have an anus. So the organisms literally die full of bacteria, right? <laughs> and so you want to clean that. You want to get rid of all that stuff. You want to try to scrape off the eggs as much as possible. So hygiene is still very, very important, um, but it can fool the clinician. So if you have a patient who's really, really good at their hygiene, you're not going to see the cholerets, right? You have to actually epilate the lash and look under a microscope to find them. So that can fool you. With the MGD patient specifically, the last thing I wanna do is throw a surfactant on top of an already lipid deficient situation, because that's going to you know, take 
take the precious myeloma away because it solubilizes it. We've gone to a, um, a tea tree oil gel-based system, a surfactant-free based system. The two that we really enjoy are the Scope tea tree oil gel. It's gentle, it's super well tolerated. Uh, we love the, um, the Zocu Shield, uh, which has a the ochre extract um, by Zocular. We really enjoy that product as well. Um, so we, we lean towards uh, surfactant-free um, options for our significantly lipid deficient patients. Awesome. Um, I, and I want to encourage all of our um, attendees there, you know, uh, Laura and, uh, you know, the, you know you, you've done a significant amount of work um, and just making your, you know, sharing your knowledge out there. And uh, you really helped me in, in my career, really help, uh, you know, sort of answer these questions to, you know, for my, for my patients. And so um, I invite you to really uh, look at her YouTube uh, videos and things like that. Um, and thank you for sharing all that information. Um, you know, here on the clinical track, there's also the um, implementation uh, track. Right now, we're going to have uh, Carly Rose uh, and uh, Daryl White, and uh, there's also going to be uh, doing the going to be doing a PBL, and then there's going to be a spotlight on dry eye treatment with Art Epstein and Chris Wolf, David Nelson, and Ana Lazar. So, um, a tremendous amount of education out there waiting for you in the other two tracks as we kind of uh, take a little break and uh, for our finale here with uh, Rich Maharaj at the end of our course. Um, Laura and Maiti, I want to thank you so much for your expert education and being a part of our program this year. And I look forward to working more with you in the future. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>